Je vais commencer par deux mots en français quand même pour vous dire que c'est toujours difficile d'être ici, bien sûr. L'endroit où se fait la physique, parce que il bon, y en a qui ralentissent des particules à quelques millicas. Nous, on est à l'ordre zéro vraiment des choses et donc ça fait toujours un peu étrange de présenter des choses qui, pour certains d'entre vous, vont paraître être de la physique un peu piètre. Mais c'est comme ça qu'on est dans différents domaines. Et c'est grâce à la physique qui est développée entre autres ici qu'on est capable de comprendre un peu ce que l'on fait. Il ne faut pas penser que ce pas des efforts, on fait des efforts considérables pour essayer d'avoir des choses qui à nouveau paraissent l'ordre zéro de la physique. Mais j'essaie de vous montrer ça. Donc aujourd'hui je vais me focaliser sur la mission Rosetta, je vais faire ça en anglais donc. Euh, mais ça va être frustrant je pense pour beaucoup d'entre vous, comme ça l'est pour nous, parce que vraiment on est au cœur de la mission, donc on n'a pas encore le recul d'abord pour... Euh, euh, pour prendre la mesure de ce qui est en train de se passer. En plus, il y a, comme vous pouvez imaginer, toujours les problèmes de, de savoir ce qu'on a le droit de dire ou ne pas dire, parce que les gens sont sensibles sur ces questions-là, sur les missions spatiales. Donc voilà, on va faire une cote mal taillée de tout ça, et surtout, euh, n'hésitez pas à interagir à tout moment si vous le souhaitez, ce qui est plus efficace pour nous. Euh, comme on m'a dit que c'était euh, en principe des gens qui, vous étiez des gens, certains que je connais, mais d'autres que je ne connais pas beaucoup, euh, qui ne sont pas forcément dans nos affaires de système solaire, de dire quelques mots d'abord du cadre général. Donc je vais commencer un petit peu par, par tout ça. Donc ça, c'est pour vous rappeler que j'ai une adresse email et que souvent les questions viennent après. Donc n'hésitez pas à contacter après si, euh, si vous le souhaitez. Euh, je réponds euh, facilement. Tout ça pour vous donner d'abord le cadre qui est celui dans lequel on travaille, qui est de dire que le... Le domaine de l'exploration spatiale du système solaire, auquel peu d'entre vous ici ont pour l'instant travaillé, peut-être qu'il y en aura, j'espère d'ailleurs, c'est un truc qui a commencé il y a finalement quelques... C'est de la préhistoire pour certains, mais c'est pas... OK, let's shift to English, yes. The, it started some, uh, a while ago, actually. We are in the first run of space exploration. And it's uh, normally the people will remind that Sputnik was October 457, but for us it was really Luna 1. And Luna 1 was a very important step, really, because the first time human sent something out of the terrestrial gravity, uh, because we had the capability to go elsewhere, and this was the moon. So really for us, it was the initiation of the interplanetary missions, in the sense that we had the capability to go and see in situ what the things look like. And if I say so, it's because this era really sort of ended now. We are just at the end of this with, uh, as you saw during the summertime, this uh, New Horizon mission arriving at Pluto, which is sort of the last target, if I can say so, of course, there are many others, but last target within the inner solar system that we wanted to have access to. So really, we are in, a, in an era of space exploration for which we have had the capability to go essentially visit each every body there, uh, inner and outer solar system, and that was really fantastic. And Rosetta is just in between, in a sense that Rosetta is just one of these moments in which we had to see, okay, what these uh, small bodies, the comet I will go back today, uh, look like. And it wasn't obvious uh, when we decided this mission, and that's something important, which was almost 30 years ago. The, um, the reason why we wanted to get there, we are not the one we are trying to understand what we see now, because meanwhile, a lot of things have happened. And that's already the problem with space activities in this domain, that we do something, but we have to extrapolate or anticipate to the question that will be there when we arrive. And for a moment, for example, we are building something that uh, if everything goes fine, we'll be back in 2060, 60. And so it's difficult to say, okay, what should we do to be just in time when we arrive? So Rosetta was um, a rendezvous mission, as you will see, the first time we had the capability not only to fly by a comet, but really to get the same speed of the comet and to follow the comet in the inner solar system. Uh, you will see that, so it's what we call the rendezvous mission, which is not trivial. If you want to slow down to be at the same velocity as uh, an interplanetary body, you've got to have means to do so. And we want to do so and even to land on that, to try to have all the information we could have, including that, and I will focus on that, the question of emergence of life or whatever it means, and uh, this concept probably is not the right one, but still, that was really the goal, and that uh, is the, the, the context in which I will essentially uh, elaborate today. Uh, what is for me fundamentally that really when you see all the, uh, the, the results of this space exploration, all these pictures here, everyone knows that is very familiar to all of you, but really that has been built over the last decades. Most of these bodies were not known 30, 40 years ago as they are now. It's been a huge, but it's, it's fine in the sense that very rapidly it goes to the uh, global patrimoine. 
and we, we are all as if we knew that forever. But most of that, even that the, the earth is, uh, is round, if you remember in the early times when we were teaching in the 60s or 70s, you had to demonstrate the, the earth was round. Now, of course, we don't do that because it's, it's well known. Although people do not even realize that the first time people could make a picture of the earth like that was in the 860s, 68, when the first time someone went out of the gravity of the earth. So everything has been built over the time, and uh, this is the view of, uh, from which we started. I mean, uh, 40 years ago, that was the understanding. Uh, essentially, just to tell you that the Earth was not even around. You had four bodies there, which were essentially not as we see them now. And really, there is just one word to characterize that. It's, well, it's fine. It's really the world of diversity. No one could imagine that we would find the diversity that we see now. And this is really the thing. For example, these four bodies here that everyone knows now, the four Galilean satellites uh, discovered by Galileo in 1610, from 1610 up to 1979, uh, really, we didn't know much more than we had in the 70th century. And only when you had the flyby and you saw these things uh, here, they are just put on, a, on the diagram here, when you see these four bodies, when you see the diversity of these bodies, I'm not going to put any emphasis here, but it's absolutely amazing that these bodies, which are exactly the same size, form at the same time from the same material at the same point in the universe, are so different today. Uh, Io on the right is the more volcanic bodies in the solar system. Every point on the surface is magma modified every thousand years. Uh, the, the one just afterwards, or on the back over there, this Callisto, it's just created as saturation. If you see a high resolution image of Callisto, you wouldn't know whether it's the moon or Mercury or whatever, it's Callisto. When you go to the second one, Europa, there is not a single crater there. It's only ice with crevasse and that sort of things. All had different evolution. And of course, this question is the same for the, for the Earth now. When we see the Earth now, we realize that uh, the, the ocean cover, that everyone thought 20 years ago that oceans would be everywhere and that uh, it was the generic feature in the universe. Uh, of course, uh, we know now, and I will go back to that, that to have liquid water stable on a body is very complex. And actually, we now realize how it went on the Earth, and probably for more than 4.2 or 3 billion years, it's been stable. The cloud cover is also something absolutely amazing. Uh, what is what here are clouds here? It's not good weather. Yesterday it was. We, you think that cloud goes in, in and out. It's not. Clouds are entirely stable over a time scale, which are millions, probably billions of years on the Earth. And that's amazingly important because, of course, we don't know the process and, uh, by which the clouds uh, really nucleate, as you know now, it's one of the critical things now because it's not only just normal thermodynamics, you go below zero and no, you have to have nucleation sites. We don't even know what the nucleation sites are. And as you know, it's fundamental for the global warming and to know whether or not part of the water that will go to the atmosphere as we warm the, the atmosphere will translate into clouds or not because that would be the only possibility to, to, to decrease a little bit the increase in temperature and that sort of thing. So everything comes more and more unique as you get there. And that's really, and you will realize why we, I put that as an introduction to the Rosetta Star because all this has gone in between the time we launch it and now. And this is the sort of thing we would like to understand. So at which scale is what we see in the solar system, in particular on the Earth, um, unique as it is now? And uh, it's not also the, the topic of this um, seminar today, but typically what we are now is finding that really the scale is probably, it might be that of the universe itself. It means that the, the possibility to find something similar to what we have here is just zero. It depends what you call, of course, a planet and the Earth in particular, but the people who are looking for Earth-like planet, for example, it's, um, I think it's a failure in the vocabulary because uh, what we call the Earth is not only a body which has a given size at a given distance from the sun. The, the distance from the sun and the sun and the size is really limit a lot the, uh, the, the possibility for you to realize what the evolution is. What we are here depends on a lot of factors which have nothing to do with essentially the astronomical uh, characteristic of the Earth. So anyway, we'll go to that. So that's why it's very unexpected. The diversity that we see now was not at all thought of even by the, the specialists at that time. Uh, and uh, just for you, and uh, I've, I promise that will be the end, <laughs> um, but it's important for us because when you look at, uh, in, within our own uh, community, we have to fight a lot. And uh, we discussed uh, recently the question of the water on Mars, for example, two weeks ago with NASA announcement, which are really stupid and scandalous in a sense. Where do we stand with that? This question of unicity of plurality of worlds is really something interesting by itself. As you know, Epicurus proposed that, even demonstrated that there should be an infinity of worlds 300 years prior to BC. That had been stopped rapidly by Greek first and then all the monotheism. 
apt to copy, I think, everything now, that Giordano Bruno has, and I think it's important to remind that he was the one who really took the Ep Epicurus uh, concept of plurality of worlds, demonstrating that not only Copernicus is right, but because all the stars and sun are the same nature, you have an infinity number of suns in space, so an infinity number of, of Earths, because the universe was infinite. And so you had to have life everywhere. And the fact that you had life everywhere has been so heretic that it has been burnt, as you know, 1600 uh, in, uh, in Rome. But then all the physics has been built essentially to assess that he was right. Galileo, of course, Newton, uh, generalizing that, Kant, Laplace. With Kant and Laplace, it was even better because for the first time in the 18th century, it has been realized that it was just a suggestion, only confirmed a few decades ago, that we had a system, that the Earth, the, the Sun and the planets are really a system. And so we have a common origin. And the cosmos became the universe because the law was universal and this and that. So life was spread over the entire universe. And if I say so, it's because that has been built over the time, and when the space activity started, that was really the dominant ideological pressure on our shoulder. Life was present everywhere. And as you know, it's still the case for most of the people now, in particular on the other side of the Atlantic, where they consider that there must be life everywhere because that's, there is no reason for the Earth to be specific. And this question of understanding the processes that make life possible on the Earth are just deciphered now, essentially. But when Sputnik was, it was really, we were all in that concept. Luna 1, when we send things, it's exactly, I put Viking here because the Viking, you know, it was, uh, it arrived in uh, the f July 4th, uh, 76, essentially to celebrate the second uh, uh, 200 years of the United States. But against what the people think, Viking was not sent to search for life. They were so convinced that there was life that the instruments on Viking were to characterize the life. The question was, what was the metabolism there? Is it O2 transformed into CO2 or CO2 transformed in O2? Uh, that was really the core questions. The question was not that life existed, because it had to exist. That was the Viking time. And because of the failure of this instrument demonstrating that, the only remaining capabilities we had to find something similar to what we have on the Earth, which is liquid water, was Titan. And the Voyager mission sent in 77 just after the Viking, were really goal. The goal was not only to go to Saturn, to fly by Jupiter and go to Saturn, but to go to Titan, the larger satellite. And if you s go to the site and show the, the pictures f showed by NASA to the Congress at that time, you will have a simulation of Voyager arriving and seeing the uh, on, on the lakes and geyser on Titan, the, uh, the, the reflection of, uh, of Saturn with Dolphin or whatever it is. It was really, the goal was really to demonstrate that there is liquid water there. Just because CH4 was viewed and no one knew that N2 was dominant. Anyway, just to remind you that by up to the end of 70s and 80s, which are exactly the time when we decided to make the Rosetta mission, the goal was really not to search for life, but we were convinced that life was there. So, diversity of the solar system was absolutely unexpected. And of course, and I will not expand on that, at the same time, start the discovery of exoplanets for which exactly the same happened. So not only the Earth is different from the other planets, it's not different from the other, that would be the same, but we are all different. Our solar system is also different from other stellar systems which are by themselves all different by themselves. And that's, of course, this notion of diversity is really the, the baseline of uh, uh, where we are now. So this question of having a common origin and diversity now is really something that uh, is behind all what we do now and Rosetta as you will see is just right there and the question is okay what drive the evolution of the planets essentially um, not trivial and the result of that is that actually when we say common origin it just uh, masks the fact that it's a sequence of processes that end over not even tens but hundred million years and we are now trying to decipher all the processes that model the evolution and the, the process, of course, and this is important, the process are generic, uh, it's already the same process, impact, gravitational interaction, whatever it is, but the form they take are so specific that they will drive the diversity of planetary evolution. And th this is really where we are now. And the question is, okay, to which level it is, and uh, the diversity is really there, not in the processes by the form the processes have taken. I will take one or two examples because that's, and the same for the solar stellar system. So collapse, migration, all this, and collisions now is well known as having happened everywhere in the diversity of form. And I will just take 
So this is the list of the questions that we had and we still have now. What are the processes uh, responsible for diversity and in particular for life emergence? To which extent are they specific to first the solar system and the Earth, probably, uh, or is it very generic? In other words, what makes us to be here? Is it something that we could think being present elsewhere? And, uh, and how, could that, how could we know whether it's elsewhere? So for the life emergence, and I will focus on that now, Three, as you know, there is three grain in the water, carbon rich and, and phosphates, essentially. For the water, I will just <laughs> also remain uh, a few minutes here uh, because I understood that no one, not, you are not necessarily all familiar with that, which, are, which is rather recent, but I think fundamental, just to mo show you how we know the processes that lend to the, to the water to be stable on, on the earth here now. It has to do with, uh, there is three major uh, processes. First, Jupiter and Saturn migration, that was absolutely fundamental. Then the injection of ice from outside to the bodies, but not as the last veneer, but during the growth of the protoplanet. And then when you have that, you need to have the water that goes to the surface and the giant impacts were fundamental there. So just summarizing that in two slides. It starts with that, which is also something that is not well known. This, of course, is well known. This is the size distribution on, on the planets in the solar system. And um, we know that forever, but all the models, and that's important, all the models that make accretion of the bodies out of a planetary disk do not do that. They do essentially this. All the models that make accretion should make Mars larger than the Earth, although it's 10 times lower. And all the modelists said, okay, well, there's a problem there, but we don't care because Mars is as it is. Only one group decided that it translates something important. That was the Nice people, the uh, Alessandro Morbidelli and others. And they published a fantastic paper on that, which I really advise you to get there. Um, this idea, that's, uh, okay, the, the blue is the, the distance beyond which you, uh, snow is stable, the famous snow line. And uh, if we create a disk, in that disk, the planet, you will have that. To get this, you need to accrete essentially from a disk which is confined within one AU. If you leave the system evolve from that, you won't have a problem to get the right distribution. The problem, of course, is how to get to that. Why the disk would have been like that? And the idea is very straightforward. You form Jupiter far away because you need to have a, a core large enough to have accreted gas, and so you need to be beyond the snow line, that's for sure. But then you start to migrate things. But if you wait sufficiently to try the migration of Jupiter for the inner disk to have started its own accretion in planetesimal, the migration that we call the migration type two will essentially empty all the disk as the Jupiter enters like that. And of course, if it has continued, I don't know whether, if it had continued, we wouldn't be here to talk. The thing is that in our system, we consider it's one model, of course, it's still to be demonstrated, validated, but probably that's the case. What happened in our system that another planet was formed, was doing formed, and Jupiter stopped about at the present Mars orbit. And what happened that Saturn, long afterwards, got to the threshold mass sufficient to go to what we call migration type one, rapidly went in the inner solar system, stopped in two of the three resonance, two turns Saturn for three of Jupiter, and they locked in that resonance, and because of the mass ratio of Jupiter and Saturn, the following evolution was that they get out. If mass had been either lower in mass or higher in mass, both would have continued to the inner solar system and it wouldn't be here. So, it's all, so again, migration is generic, but this very specific migration put the system in, in that configuration that finally we had a confined disk that led to that. What to generate the ratio of the masses? The is that random and they happen? By it is. No, the, the. Yeah, the question is, if I understand well, what, um, where the mass ratio of Jupiter and Saturn come from? Well, it has to do with the way our own disk was distributed in mass, and of course, if the disk was distributed different way, the Saturn will have started at a different position, and it would reach the inner solar system where Jupiter would have been at another position, and we would not have the mass ratios of the planet as we are there now. So the problem is not really to get Saturn at the right mass, because Saturn had to have the right mass to get migrated, but the point from which it migrated, which corresponds to the point at which it will meet Jupiter within the inner system, depends on the structure of our disk. So depending on the structure of the disk, you will get finally inner bodies entirely different. If the thing is much thinner, you will never get the position to get 
inner planets just because the, the large giant planets will go down to the sun and we won't be here. So it's essentially that, yes. Is the mechanism of accretion sufficient? So is the mechanism of accretion sufficiently well understood to justify this? Okay, if the answer is binary, yes or no, I would answer no, uh, but it's never like that. No, the, the point is that, you know, it's very new, all that. Uh, this even question of migration of the inner solar system is just starting as, you know, it's a matter of a few years. The problem is that the people who do accretion do not make migration. The people who do migration do not do accretion. So we still need to have groups trying to put together the uh, algorithm that will do that. So you're right. The people who do accretion start with a starting point. You don't make migration and you try to see, okay, if I have a disk, how do I finally get the body there? But these people do not know how the disk was formed. And what these, these people did is that they took the assessment that if we have a disk like that, the accretion will get the right size and they try to make the, uh, the migration that goes with. So you're right, we don't know yet how to accrete that. But it's true that if we get to whatever the accretion process is, if we start with another disk uh, geometry, we will not get the right mass distribution. So this paper is fundamental. Look at that. It's nature July 14, so it's easy to remember in 11. Good. But the, the reason why I wanted to say that, it's not only the question of generosity, it's also that, of course, if you had only the accretion with inner, the inner disk, you would not be here either because there would not be water. The inner disk was essentially non-hydrated. So you had to have some water coming and essentially icy grain from the outside came inside. And this is why really water, and like it has been said a few months ago, all the water we have here come from the possibility for the outer solar system bodies to incorporate ice, but during the accretion itself, and that's as you will see is very important. So we had bodies exactly as the comet are now, which are remnant of these uh, early times, interacting with that. And of course, part of the inner solar system also went outside, and this is how you refill the asteroid belt, and uh, that's how the asteroids went also. And the asteroids are a secondary product that comes a few million years after the migration of Jupiter and Saturn. This is why when the people say the water comes from the asteroids and not from the comet, it's stupid because the water in the asteroid themselves come from what is in the comets. It's the same process, of course, that feed water in the inner solar system by that. So instead of that, we have here, we had a lot of water coming in. And the question, of course, is the water was trapped during the accretion itself. How you get the water up to the surface? And this is very important. I will not be long on that. but. We know that after a few million years, you had something like 50 protoplanets in our inner solar system colliding very heavily, and, the collide, and these giant impacts are responsible for the further evolution. And the Earth was subjected to that, and you know that the geometry of the impact was fundamental for the rest of the evolution. If we had a frontal impact, we would not be here. Of course, everything would have been destroyed. If we are very tangential, we would not be either here because most of the material would have been spread in the escape from the Earth. The geometry was said that out of this impact, we had a circumterrestrial disk of material out of which the moon accreted, and uh, there is a lot of impact of that. And part of that is that the, the, um, the temperature of the Earth went to a few thousand degrees, so it was a magma. And the magma, against the intuition, did not put the water out. The magma retained the water. But when the magma cooled down, most of the water went to the surface, 3,000 meters of water, that the ocean. So the oceans were stable from that time. And about 10 times more in the mantle. And the amount of water in the mantle make the mantle to have exactly the plate tectonic that we have. Because the fluidity is directly a function of the water you have here. So the geometry of the impact is fundamental for the entire evolution afterwards. So as a conclusion of that, the water, we know the history, it comes from cometary-like bodies, and you will see that we've seen that. Yes? Before I get lost, uh, what is the reason why the Nicolaitis is there? Merci. Merci. So why is it that at the beginning of the formation of the planets, there is water in the form of ice on these uh, uh, comets? And uh, there is no water in the solar system, in the disk, which is going to form the, the planets. And then we have the exchange you have described. But at the beginning, there is water somewhere and not somewhere else. W okay, maybe, okay, I was maybe too fast. No, the thing is that there was water everywhere, but below a given distance, the temperature was too high for the water to be stable as ice. It was vapor. So in the inner solar system, you have vapor, water, and outside you have ice and you accrete essentially within solid material. So 
out of there, I mean, at large distances, three, four AU, you create material which is solid, but most of the solid material at large distances is icy bodies. So you can create large bodies uh, very rapidly because the water is dominant, and this is how you create bodies out of which then you can create gas, and that's the way giant planets come. In the inner solar system, you add water in the form of uh, vapor, and when you accrete the gas, uh, you accrete the material, most of the water remains in the gas phase, and so it's not blocked there. So you don't have sufficient water blocked within the grains to, to grow the, uh, the, the ocean that we'll see afterwards. So you need to have solid grains getting inside and mixed during the thing. That's the model we have. Good. So for the phosphorus, I will not say something except one point. Uh, as you know, you need phosphorus to bring uh, the, uh, the DNA as it is here. Uh, it, I think well understood that phosphate essentially come from the leaching of the continent by the water. Uh, on, so that's the only thing important here. Uh, phosphate are in the basaltic material. You would get them in the oceans in which life will start, essentially by, because on the Earth, because water was stable as a liquid, you have the continuous possibility for the water to evaporate, condense, and then it rains, and the rains essentially get the phosphate down to the, to the ocean. So for the phosphate, it's no problem. It just means that if you had a, a, a planet ocean, as people believed it might have been, then you would not have life just because you have no possibility to leach any continent. You need to have an exchange of uh, water and solid material continent to get many cations, including the, the phosphates. So now let's go to the carbon-rich material, which is really the core of what I wanted to say here. The, of course, the, the question remains, and uh, okay, you can think why, but it's obvious how that the carbon-rich compounds that are present here are formed. And you know that for a long time, the people considered that Miller-Euro type experiment that everyone knows here were the dominant process. So um, the Miller-Euro experiment, and again, this was exactly the case in the 80s when we uh, started the, uh, as you will see, the story here. It just to remind you how it was, but I don't need that. The Miller Ure is essentially Ure, you know, and Miller is as a student in the 50s, started the first experiment, and essentially the essence was the following. We think they thought that the way to grow large molecules were to, to start with very small molecules, typically CH4, NH3, N2, or whatever it is, small compounds. You put that with boiling water, which will essentially uh, uh, mimic the, uh, the, the water in the early oceans of the Earth. You put energy like des um, éclairs, je sais pas comment dit discharge, lightning, voilà. and you simulate that, and you see whether or not you can grow things that will finally go to life. And everyone knows that uh, the, end, the outcome of that is that you eff efficiently grow a lot of molecules, very complex molecules, and there, but of course never uh, a single organism there. And the question was still there, are we sure that we start with that? There has been a huge number of experiments in Orsay, in, uh, in many institutions, in France still doing now, trying to see what would be the optimized uh, mixture of things. And in the early 80s, it was clear that if you start from CH4 instead of CO2, that would be much helpful. So the people think, okay, let's see whether or not we could have started. But the problem is that when you look at the inner planets, CO2 is dominant in Venus, in Mars, and also on the Earth, if you remind that, uh, if you recall that it was CO2 that was transformed into carbonates finally. So we had CO2 in the inner solar system, and when you see the giant planet, it's CH4. So the question is, have we <coughs> internally transformed the CH4 into CO2, or are the giant planets transformed the CH2, CO2 into CH4? What was the dominant species at the beginning? And if I say so, it's because that was really the question asked when, in the early 80s, we suddenly had the capability to go and visit a comet. And that was fundamental because for the first time, I sketched that, we had the possibility to go and visit a comet in 86 when the Halley Comet went back. And that was the start of many things. So you know how the comet looked like, although none of you, I'm sure, have ever seen a comet. It's not so frequent, but still. But the important thing is that the scales here, the coma here, is typically millions of kilometers. And we know that the body itself, OK, I don't care about that, the body out of which it's made, it's a few kilometers. So the question was, for the first time, to try to go as close as possible within the coma to go and visit, really, the nucleus itself. And there has been this flyby in 86 for the first time. Five probes were there. It was really a fantastic um, mission. The two Japanese were really for the plasma physics, but you had three 
internal with Giotto the first time, ESA had a very close by flyby, a few hundred kilometers. But the, the precision on the, the, the position of Nicholas was so low that we, Giotto could not have gone so close if the two Vega mission, which are the Soviet mission that goes at 10,000 10, kilometers, had not the capability to visit first and try to tell them the nucleus is there. And that's what exactly what happened. Uh, Vega were just fantastic mission, but I have no time to discuss that here. But importantly, and uh, you will see why it's important, it has been a major, I think that's really in the space exploration, there has been very rarely such discoveries. It's not been really uh, advertised because there was no US mission there and we're not as good at there to, to make publicity of what they do, but it was really important. And essentially the idea was, we were getting to a comet and everyone considered the comets are made of 80% of ice. You will see in a few minutes that it's probably not true, but we thought it was 80% of ice and if you go to see ice, it's very bright. Um, Le Mont Blanc est blanc pour de bonnes raisons. And so the idea was, okay, let's get prepared to see something very bright. And the uh, amazing result that the, the, the nucleus was the darker object ever seen in the solar system, darker than this and probably it's three times darker than the darker region of the moon. Although, and that's important, it was essentially primarily made of ice. We had an instrument on board on the Vega mission named EKS, an infrared spectrometer, in which you have the emission line, I have no time to discuss that, but we saw that uh, in infrared, you saw H2O emitted uh, rapidly. But at the same time, we saw that there was a big peak around three something micrometers, and the people know in this room, I guess, that three something is close to the places in which in inter interstellar medium you see a lot of uh, emissions with uh, 6872, and also that one. We didn't have the capability to have a, uh, an accurate measurement of this burn because no one expected that really. Because again, the question was CO2 over C was it CO2 or CH4. It was neither CO2 or CH4. The dominant molecules in these comets were complex molecules that we saw in the infrared and then we saw by mass spectrometry. And that was very important because we had a mass spectrometer on the orbit, on, on the, I should have said that the, the rendezvous was at a 70 kilometers a second. So the time when you are in this position, in this position, after it's two minutes. So you had two minutes to make the entire measurement. And thanks to, on the, the two Vega probes, you had a big platform, 150 kilograms, which had the capability to point constantly, although Jodo was just spiraling like that. It was to point and, uh, in a very bright way because all that was technology of the 70s. They had a capability and so during two minutes they measured that and we had a mass spectrometer on board that is essentially a target and the velocity of impact of the grains on the target was that, that they were ionized and with the time of flight mass spectrometer you could analyze all the species. And I have some enlargement here. This is typical of the uh, mass spectrum here and what you see here is uh, the bonds of H, C, N and O uh, together with some others here with the target and silicates. The important thing is that half of the grains encountered as only C, H, O, and N as atom there. No silicon, carbonate, whatever it is. It was just pure organic grains. It was the discovery, the famous discovery of what we call the Champ particles. It has been discovered that most of these cometary material in terms of the carbons are grains because that was measured at a few 10,000 kilometers from the nucleus, very stable. And these molecules embedded in the ice made the eyes very absorbing. So there is a lot of things which have been done there. So suddenly we realized that a comet has trapped these molecules and there were a good reason to consider that these molecules were there since the time the comet formed. Because every time the comet goes close to the sun, in the case of Halley, meters of material are get over. So the next surface is a really very bright new surface that was depths below before the last perihelion passage. So we knew that these materials were probably the end point of the collapse of a cloud. Everyone knows that uh, when you observe in radio astronomy, clouds are 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5th molecule per um, cubic centimeters. You have already a huge variety of molecules. But what we are talking on here now is molecules which have been formed to the end of the collapse up to density which are 10 to the 12, 10 to the 15 particle per cubic centimeter. No one had never idea of the composition of these grains. And we realized that finally a very specific chemistry might have taken place during that collapse. Uh, again, it's an iron grain, cosmic ray with the energy source only. Chemistry, very specific, totally different from uh, Miller year experiments were. And we didn't know, of course, up to now what the composition is, but we realized that it's a very specific probably specific enough, much more specific than the Miller-Urea experiment. As you know, in these Miller-Urea, you have such a variety of uh, amino acids, for example, that it's not so specific enough to, uh, to cope with what life uses, which is only 20 of them. And then the question is, okay, what is this chemistry? And I will go back to that. But that's really what finally went here. And 
the other question I will ask, of course, is this chemistry that happened during the collapse is generic to any collapse so that should be present in any molecular clouds getting rise to stellar uh, systems, or is it very specific to ours? In other words, of course, every collapse will make a chemistry, but it might be that in our case, the fact that the sun arrived at a given time with a given rotation period with the polarized light that might in particular make these uh, Levozier, Dextrosier things very specific. As you know, we've demonstrated that already. It might be very specific. So the question was there, and uh, that's what I put here. So we don't know the answer, of course, of that, but it might again be within this question that we ask. To which level is the process that we see generic or specific? Already this is a question. So, we understood that there is something very important there because these molecules might have been the molecules embedded with the ice in the planetary oceans and responsible for life emergence. So that was the case in, um, in, uh, in the 80s. And actually, uh, for the story, it's important that at that time we had the idea that the post-Vega or the post halley encounter mission should be to get to a comet, take samples, bring them back to the Earth. Uh, to analyze with the tools we have in the lab. And we actually built that mission. It was named Cometary Nuclear Sample Return. It was NASA, ESA, the Soviets were there, so all the agencies were there. And it happened uh, what uh, very, rap very often <laughs> happens. The NASA quit without even making a phone call. And so ESA alone could not make this sample return <coughs> mission. So we decided that if we didn't have the possibility to get there, bring the sample back, we would do the opposite, build a laboratory and send the lab there. And that has been the Rosetta mission. So Rosetta was built at that time with the goal we had at this time, which are that probably life is spread over the entire universe, but there is something specific in the comet that comets will tell us what the material was when life might have started. For those who might be interested, uh, what happened in that time that uh, in the horizon 2000 of ESA, there was four L mission, as we'd say now. And uh, Rosetta, the first two were launched already in the 80s. And so the question was within uh, what Rosetta and what was called first at that time would be number three and four. And finally, Rosetta were three. And first that became Herschel Planck, as you know, came afterwards. So that was decided in November uh, 93, so long ago. Uh, and we had eight years of development because it was supposed to be launched early 03, 2003. And, um, Okay, uh, what, because we, want, uh, we wanted to make a rendezvous this time, and we want to make the rendezvous far, far enough from the sun for the sun not to have modified the material, we want to go very far, and so we want to get the comet by par derrière, and so we had to go above, beyond 5 AU. So we had only nuclear, nuclear cells, of course, so we, build an, we had to build something with 60 meters square of solar panels. It's two times larger than this room. It's a huge thing. And um, there were 10 instruments on board, plus uh, a lander, which in itself have uh, 10 instruments. Actually, what is important that the, well, important, the lander was not part of the mission. The lander was also subjected to an AOF as an instrument. We were allowed to propose to land on the comet, but ESA didn't pay for that. It's just the reason why it, it became number three instead of four. Uh, didn't have the money to be the entire set. So the, we had the possibility to ask for a lander. And actually a few of us proposed a lander. And uh, we proposed, I proposed with Kness a lander and many others. And finally, it's been merged into uh, two lenders. One uh, we did, so we finally merged with, the, with JPL and we had a JPL Kness lander and uh, was responsible for that one. And there has been a German that didn't want to merge. And finally, what happened that the US again quit it and so we couldn't make her by ourselves, but that was a good thing because thanks to that, all Europe merged into what became Philae. But that's why we, there is two responsible for that, one in France and one in Germany. So we built that, but it's not an ESA stuff. So we had to build a consortium. And when we say ESA landed or Europe landed, it's not really true. Uh, ESA has, of course, we are part of the ESA mission and ESA, as you will see, is important there. But it's really something we built with our, our institute. We had to build a consortium as we could. And so there is, it's not a very clever system because we had to do that at rather low cost with the technology of these times. As you will see, for example, some of the, the images has been taken by camera that we developed at AES. The, these cameras, again, it's technology of the early 90s, operate at minus 150 degrees C. So it's CCDs, but we had to, to make the right electronics to be able to operate so low in temperature because we had no other way to do, and the same for many other systems. So that's what we did, and we had eight years to develop that up to December. To, and uh, something important happened uh, 
December 11, in 2002, is that the Ariane 5, prior to ours, didn't go to space. Uh, as you might know, it was one of the big uh, failures of Ariane 5. It went to the ocean. And actually, we were very happy because uh, uh, it could have been ours. So it was not ours, it was the previous one. So, of course, the problem is that we had to wait for them to repair the... So we had to wait another year in Kourou. So instead of being launched in 02, in 03, we were launched in 04. Meanwhile, our comet uh, was not, no longer in the field of view. So we had to find another comet, and we did that. And the comet was finally uh, the comet named uh, shoyumov gerasimenko And what you have here in Kourou is Dorda in the center, Shoyumov on the left, and Mrs. Gerasimenko on the right. They are still alive, as you will see. Um, we, we put Mrs. <coughs> Garasimenko there because, as you know, I don't know whether I have a picture of that now. Um, they discovered that, as every comet is discovered, they, they are not looking for comet, they are looking for many other things in a Schmidt telescope, and they observe that after 20 minutes, a point has moved. And so they, that show him off are responsible for the program, but Garasimenko was the one who showed that something moved. So she did the work, so that's why she has her, her name there. And um, so we launched it. And this is what happened 10 years later, which is last July, not this July, but the first time we saw the comet was July 14, actually, uh, last year. And when we saw that, it was still at million kilometers, we were really, it was awful because we said we will never be able to land on such an object. Of course, it's not running at that speed, <laughs> but uh, not much lower. And it was double structures. And we said, how can we land on that with a system we have which has absolutely no capability of, uh, you know, the only degree of freedom we have is the, the attitude of the spacecraft, the orbital spacecraft, out of which we will be launched, and the velocity vector that we will choose in direction and intensity. That's the only thing we can do. Monitor the velocity and ask the orbiter to put it in the right direction. But if you are, and you will see, we, we are really, this is, the scale is, very, you know, it's a few kilometers. We are released for 22 kilometers. So if you have a small angle deflection, you are not right by whatever, because your spring in 10 years is not exactly as it is, and you are, if you go even 200 meters apart, the gravity is too low to get you back here. So the risk we had was really just to miss the comet. So anyway, uh, we were not sure that we would be able. And the worst while, when we were finally, get closer. When we saw the surface, and everyone knows that now, but when we saw the surface for the first time, we say it's even worse. Not only it turned, but it saw there is so many things on the surface we'll never be able to stand, just to stand, which is actually true. So that was not really, but we had to find a place. So a few images that we got, and these are the images we had in hand when we had finally last summer to choose a place where to land. So we knew that just extended the dynamics and that on top of that, it's it was already at gassing at 3 AU. It was at 4 AU at that time. So it was not obvious. So uh, our uh, US colleagues make a lot of things, including this artist view, uh, which said, okay, you will never land because that's, you will have something like that. And you know, it will be, so we are really afraid of the possibility we had, we would have to land. So the reality is that, and because it's a double structure, the question was, is it two bodies that interacted to make one? Or is it just the opposite, that we have one body which is now being split into two? Both were and are actually are still possible. Now we're convinced that's probably uh, the first is true. We have ways now to, to look at all the structures within them, and we see that all these bodies are highly structured with, uh, with fracture that we can follow, and they are homogeneous within each lobe, but dis distinct from the two. So probably we have a low velocity impact, and this is important to understand the, the, uh, the evolution, the collisional evolution of the early solar system. Um, maybe I'll have time to discuss that afterwards. Just a few images. Uh, we were very surprised to see what we saw. A lot of erosion here. Again, the scale is typically 500 meters of the erosion, the, the cliff that we see here, and a lot of deposition here. Uh, here or there, so I can be fast, that's where we landed finally. So, and you have a huge number of very round structures like this one. It's not craters, it's nothing to do with crater, impact craters. These bodies have not a single impact crater identified, uh, although it, it might have been surprising. The rounded structures are due to the fact that the overall density is very low, 0.5, the porosity is very high, 60 to 70 percent porosity, and there is some ice, you will see inside, not 80 percent, probably only 15, 20 percent, but sufficient to outgas when we get closer. And when you have the outgassing, you just make a lot of hole and you just fall down. So all these are essentially fault made by the evolution of the comet when it outgasses. So it's only outgassing features. 
Also, what is very misleading here that because we stress the dynamics, it looks like very bright. It's very dark. I mean, normally, if you take an image, if you were to take the image, it would be entirely dark. You would not see that there is something in your field of view. You have to stretch a lot to see differences here. Again, because it's the scale. now the scale is typically 500 meters here. It's large. This is also, all these are 100 meters. You will go to closer. So it just, you know, when you see that, you have no idea what it is. You think it's, it may be even snow, you can, s but it's not true. It's not a place in which you would uh, ski because essentially it's carbon rich material everywhere. And this is something important that we had already the possibility within the infrared spectrometer we had on board Virtis on the orbiter to measure the composition of that. And this is on the right, different colors, are different spots, but what's important, they are essentially all the same. And what the two features, the two bonding grades that you have here are the places in which you should have the H2O absorption feature, and you don't have a single. There is no ice at the surface at all, not, nowhere on this planet, on this comet. And uh, these big features here, the famous three micron features, not resolved at that scale, although the sprint is something like 10 meters. It's a mixture of aromatic and aliphatic things that goes from 2.9 to 3.4 or something. We don't have from orbit the capability by just spectroscopy to know what specific minerals uh, com see rich compound. But the important thing that the surface is entirely covered by carbon rich grains. These are the domains. So all the, all the images that you see, whatever the scales, are essentially that. And we have in orbit a uh, different instrument that can measure the composition of what is released. And this was the very l first list of compounds. You will see a few others in a moment, uh, which have been, of course, H2 and CO2 are here, with many other small compounds, uh, which are both carbon rich. There is some nitrogen, and you will see it's important, and, and sulfur compounds. So we, start, we started, it was a year ago already, to have an idea of the composition of what is released. Then we've got to select a landing site, and that's based on what you just said. So a lot of people want to go where it's in green here, which is essentially, the, there is a, a feature about 500 meters large that everyone wanted, not everyone, but the, uh, the engineers essentially at, at ESA wanted to land on that because it was smooth and probably more uh, achievable. Uh, I was among those who strongly opposed to that because it was obvious that these places here has been processed already a, lo a lot, uh, probably one of the most processed places and we really wanted to have the pristine material. So we decided not to go there, finally we, we, we gained on that and we decided to go rather here, uh, just eccentric here. And there was many reasons for that. One of course is this one because there was an obvious uh, reason why to go, but the, importantly it's because we knew that it was, and as you will see afterwards, it's, we were likely to do so. So we had the uh, filet on board, and uh, the way we make images is, instead of having, as the US do with a camera and a mask that turns, we decided to make a panorama things. So we should develop very small cameras and put cameras all around. So we did that. We have seven cameras on board, very small, 50 grams, and this uh, famous camera that goes to minus 150 degrees C. And uh, I named that Shiva just because Shiva, it's well known, has many sensors and one brain, and that's exactly what we have on board. And you have a vision on, the, on the, all the uh, field of view of all these seven cameras. And this is an image that I really like. It's the, uh, the first selfie, uh, they the like to say, that we took in September last year, so two months prior to launch. We are still on board, so you, what you see on the left here, uh, can I move, yes. What you see here is the, the Rosella spacecraft. We are here, and this is one of the solar panels, 15 meter. It's lighted on the other side, uh, so you should not see anything, but you have some reflected, and you have the comet on the, on the top here that you see from, uh, fi uh, from 50 kilometers. It was uh, September 8, and this is one month later, and I like very much this picture. It was the last one we did from the orbiter before being released, and this picture has been taken exactly at the distance from which one month later, in November, we will be released and ejected. So we finally were ejected for a free fall to that comet uh, here, where we decided to go. Um, okay, I will pass over the, um, uh, the, the way it happened. Uh, but we, okay, these are now a few artists' view of what we expected would happen. We wanted to do that November 11. It's been shifted for obvious reasons to November 12, in particular because it was a French-German venture. So we couldn't do that. And, but we hoped that it would be ejected. Um, November 11, it was exactly the point at which we were at 3.0 AU, and we decided to do that at 3.0 AU, that's why. 
So we want it to be ejected this way, and we hope that you know it would be like that. Would be ejected with everything, re and then finally everything will be the, the feet would be released, the antenna, the magnetometer, whatever would be released. So we hope to be like that, and uh, everything deployed after separation that will have a, a soft descent like that, and finally land safely, and uh, of course to measure all what we wanted to, and we hope that we will land like that, and at given point uh, we'll be. Uh, sit on our three feet with the orbiter just there operating. So that was the dream. And um, what is important that we finally decided after many things, a given night to do that, although it was very complex this night because uh, just for you to, we had the, during, uh, again, we were, if the comet is here, we had to be 20 kilometers over, but to get there, the orbiter has a lot of maneuvers to do that. And when it's in here, it couldn't go back to the previous things easily. So uh, the ESA wanted to be sure that if they get there, we are ready to operate. So there is a lot of go and no go during the night. And a few hours prior to be there, ESA wanted us to say, okay, are you ready? Are you sure you're ready? And all the tests we did at that time, during that night, they answered that we are not ready. Everything failed. Everything we wanted to put on the orbiter, on the lander, failed operating. So it was like a catastrophe because at ESO there was something like uh, 1,500 uh, journalists, 400 TV, everything. And at midnight, we knew that at 7 in the morning, we would not be able to do that. So ESA gave us two more hours to understand what happened, test it, change it, verify, and convene them. So we had to do that. We did that, actually. And we understand what was wrong, so we had to reach out things. And finally, we made the staff. And at a given point, we... 28 minutes. Yes, to communicate there, it's 28 minutes, and then 28 minutes back. So it's an hour. It's an hour typically. So you, it's not real time. Yes. So finally, at the real time, we said, okay, go. We knew the orbiter would be at the right position. We hoped it would be at the right position. But again, we didn't have the knowledge of that. But we we followed that, and we didn't know whether or not we knew. We had the signal that we have been released uh, during the descent, and then we have. This image is absolutely a splendid image that is in large here. It has been taken from the orbiter during the descent. We have been released there, and that's an enlarged thing. Of course, we got the image only the other day, so we didn't know during the descent. But it's a splendid image. And when you, that was the, you know, that's what we hoped, and this is the reality. When all the feet deployed, the antenna deployed, the magnetometer deployed, everything exactly as we hoped it would be. So really, we were very happy. And so we could follow all the descent, but afterwards. So the only thing we could is to wait. So we have all this has been taken during descent from the order we, we managed to make all this. And on the lander itself, we had a camera, a down looking camera that every second or so make images, makes a ring buffer. So we keep only the last seven up to the touchdown. At the touchdown time, we stop things. So we have this, the last seven images. And here they are. So this is taken from 67 meter, then 57. And so we are closer and closer during the descent. And this is the very last image taken from nine meters over the surface, and the field is about 10 meters too. So this is where we land, finally. Although, so, and we had a touchdown signal right here, and actually it's 100 meters from the, the target point. So we're very happy. It was not obvious we go 100 meters, as I say, from 500 million kilometers from the Earth. <laughs> but it, and when we had the touchdown signal, everyone was really happy. So you see Dordain, Churyumov, which was here, and. Uh, we had the signal that we are here. So uh, we drink a lot. Uh, others were even at, uh, this is taken here, Cite, you recognize a few of them probably here, looking at, uh, hoping to get, no, the, I'm show this one because they were convinced that we would land and bring immediately the images there. <laughs> and so uh, they are waiting for our images. So actually, as soon as we have drank a little bit, immediately I went to the first floor, it was at Izok, to find because the first thing that we have planned is to make the panorama where we landed. So I, I took the images, and this is the very first image that we took. And that was absolutely awful, because it was taken five minutes after we touched down, and it was obvious that we were moving, that uh, we are not at rest on the comet. And we took a few other measurements from other instruments, and it was obvious that we are no longer on the comet. So we had touched down, but we escaped. And of course, we didn't know what the velocity we knew the velocity at which we were ejected. We knew the velocity at which we touched down, which is 1.1 meter per second. And the escape velocity is 0.7. And we didn't know whether our velocity, what the amount of energy dumped in the surface and what the, whether we would be like that or like that. So we had no way to know. And 
nothing else to do than trying to reshuffle all the sequences. So this is what we did during the night. We shuffled the sequence. Supposedly, we landed somewhere. What should we do? We had to uh, think of, OK, images. So, but we have only one chance. So uh, right integration time on there. So we did that, spend the night as we could, and wait. We didn't know, because we didn't know where we would be after that. We would not know at what time it would happen, because the, the, the thing rotates a lot. We would not be at what time the orbiter would send the, the comments to Philae to make the things, and then Philae back to that. So it was a terrible night, up to a little after 7 in the morning when we got this image which was absolutely amazing because we had exactly what we wanted to, a still image where a foot of our lander on the comet itself. And uh, we were landed. This is the next one, and immediately we put the two on one. And this was obtained there, so the 13 in the morning. Uh, so you, you can imagine we are relaxed, uh, released. Everyone cried. I mean, there was everyone there. But uh, it wasn't obvious that we had landed in a place where we wanted and could communicate. Uh, so we had built something 20 years ago that landed on the older system body and we knew that it was important because at least we were ready to operate. And uh, so we had a dream, it became a reality, uh, suddenly it changed. But then we have all the cameras and so we try to see all the other cameras, what they see, so these are the first two ones. And then we see this one and finally we see one foot here, nothing in the background, not touching anything. So we all, but when we, again, increase the dynamic, we saw this, and we saw that in the background there is something that uh, enlightened by the, the a contre jour, voilà, in English. Uh, so there was something there, but dynamics here, for those who know, it's uh, 4DN, so really it's essentially very, very dark. But the, the, the quality of these CCDs are absolutely fantastic. And so uh, we have this, and uh, okay, uh, I bet there are these fractures, a lot of things that we are doing with that, uh, I may say. I call that the perihelion clip because when we landed, it was November, we knew that because it was a 3 AU, we would get closer to, to the sun. Around March, the temperature would go too high for us to be within our limits and we would die just because it would be overheated. Because we were shadowed by the cliff, I call that the perihelion saying, well, we might be capable of operating up to the perihelion, which happened last uh, August. And that's it's, I hope, the reality that we are now in a good condition to operate thanks to the fact. So the fact that we are shadowed was a real problem because we couldn't, we didn't have enough energy to operate after the first battery that went down directly after 60 hours finished operating. We had also the possibility to recharge what we call the secondary battery with solar panels, but we didn't have enough sun. So we died essentially at that time, waiting for better times, which are coming now. So we knew that it was a plus and minus uh, with that. And one of these were even worse because we had uh, one of the uh, concept, uh, one of our instruments antenna pointing to the sun, to, to the space, and nothing behind. So we realized suddenly, and the, the others were sat in the shadow that I'm not. So we had landed that really in a very odd attitude, <coughs> completely gangwa. And when we tried to, uh, that's a picture I made, when we tried to reconstruct the way we had landed, uh, and this morning there, I saw that, okay, it should be like that, one feet out, and, uh, you know, it's a very strange behavior. And so we had landed, but, uh, okay. So this is a reconstruction that we did afterwards, and uh, again, <coughs> these are some views that I will pass rapidly, showing, well, where we are probably in a, in a hole. Uh, it's not very easy to operate, as you can realize now. And so this is the best reconstruction of our system. We are not in the three, we are almost vertical. And the problem is that the, uh, the antenna, these are our antennas. And instead of communicating with the space, they are essentially communicating with the wall. And we are, and the, the beams are essentially reflected there. And we think that the reflection is made on the material, which is carbon rich material, which has this resistivity that grows with, that goes to zero when the temperature increases. It's much more reflective. And you have a lot of interferences which are distractive in the good, essentially at the most moment now. And this is part of the reason why we have so difficult contact now. That's where we are. So this is the big 500 meters. We're on the other side, actually. So we were on the other side and we went here. And uh, it's good that we did that because if we had started here, we would have gone lower and we would never have been able to communicate and we would not even know now that we are on the comet that we have landed because we would never have been able to, to try to have any connection with the orbiter. The orbiter was just on the other side, so 
it's really a matter of a few tens of meters uh, at the limit of where we could communicate with the orbiter. So, in a sense, the cooperation with the comet was very efficient. The, the comet really is cooperative. So, the fact that we bounce like that was very good because thanks to that we have a new physics that we have not as thought of. For example, uh, the surface is uh, totally different from what we expected. At that time we thought that probably the surface is essentially made of uh, ice and so we have what I call the sintered ice but sintered but not by pressure but by thermal processes. If you have you know constant thermal evolution every six years which is the time when the comet comes back you may finally harden your very top surface and that's the reason possibly why we rebound. The other possibility which is probably more likely that this surface is not really ice made but carbon rich made and these structures which are very fluffy acts like a trampoline and essentially you, you bend and rebound without breaking anything and you will see that. So all the, everything has been published now so this I, at least I can say and this is the image before and after where we landed, this uh, image that I showed you before and this one I like because this is exactly, you see the three feet where we were again as seen from orbit and the good thing is that when we touch down prior to be there uh, we lift a cloud of grains and most of these grains went into our instrument themselves and we had planned and that's why the good thing that after landing we would do a lot of things a panorama but also many other things including putting the spectrometers on to essentially measure what would be released out gas from the uh, from the comet at the time we would land without even heating the ovens in which the material would have been and that's exactly what happened the instrument measured a few tens of minutes after we touched down not landed but touched down we are in space hundreds of meters above of the surface we remained two hours in space prior to land so during these two hours we made a lot of science and in particular we have measured the composition of these but the composition what was the, the, the cloud of grains went into the pipes of our instruments the pipes were a little warmer than the material itself so what was released at a sort of low temperature ambient temperature typically was measured so we have only the volatile part of these carbon rich compounds but this is very interesting because that has been measured you have here a list of, uh, of uh, 16 molecules which have been uh, discovered this way and uh, we are happy because most of them uh, well for some of them we thought they might have been there but some of them were not even expected there and uh, they're important because in everyone who likes to make some uh, biochemistry here know that from that you go to sugar rapidly and amino acids if needed so there might be although it's only the volatile part of this they are the constituent of the biotic chain out of which you might go to there so comets are not really only these uh, the, you know what people call the dirty ice balls it's not the case we could measure the dust over ice ratio and the dust over ice, instead of being ice 80% and dust 20%, it's exactly the opposite. You have the, the ice is only 15 or 20%. All the rest is what we call dust. But dust, and this is important, the dust is essentially this carbon rich grain that you saw in the images, and I will go back to that if I have time. The grains are essentially this carbon rich grain, very fluffy, which are typically millimeter size, it's not micron size, millimeter size, body of things, which are created during the collapse of the grain, which are, to our idea, the major constituents of all the bodies in the uh, outer solar system, it's not uh, in opposition to what it thought now. These bodies are not primarily made of ice. Of course, ice is stable, so if you have the ice, ice will be embedded there. And when we go close to the sun, of course, it sublimates and makes this activity. But most of the dom dominant constituents are these carbon rich grains. And they are up to <coughs> boulders of typically one meter. One meter is the size of the boulders during the accretion process in uh, 4.5 billion years ago you first accreted this millimeter sized carbon rich grains and then in the process of accretion you go to typically meter scale which we see everywhere on the surface and which are the one around Philae when it is now. So we have at reaching distance really the material out of which the solar system formed in all the forms from sub millimeter size to millimeter up to meter and this is the material we can analyze now. And this is why I've named this instead of the I dirty ice balls Comets are really organ organics material with some ice in, so that's why I put organ ice with an E just to say ice is embedded in the organics. So, important thing that when you have a comet arriving in the atmosphere, of course the ice essentially sublimates in the atmosphere, and if ice would have been dominant, you would never get the grains down to the oceans. If the carbon rich grains are the dominant things, rather stable, then they could go up to the ocean. So now we are absolutely convinced that's really uh, we don't need to go to other chemistry than the one that formed these carbon-rich grains, although we don't know yet what it is. 
And um, we have already discovered many other molecules than those, uh, including uh, the only amino acid which have been found for the moment is glycine. Uh, we have uh, aromatic things up to two, two chains connected to naphthalene, uh, which has not been published yet, so it should not be on the website. Um, these are the two, uh, which are the more <coughs> complex uh, to date molecules that have been found. But again, these are the low temperature volatile that has been found. For the moment, we have not been capable of measuring this material which is there, uh, which is uh, half a meter or a meter from us. And this is really the constituents. So all the grains you see here are typically millimeter scale, and they are the, the core of the, all the you know, out of solar system bodies, uh, and they are here forever in the comet here. You have some grains uh, of, uh, of ice that you see here, and again. So we have really that, but we would like now to be able to observe it. When you see uh, this outgassing that we see now, uh, because uh, the comet went close to the uh, perihelium, and so these are images taken a few weeks ago, um, all, these, all the material that you see here are not made of ice, essentially. These are the, all the outgassing that you see here are organic material, but low temperature again release organic material. For the moment, we still do not know <laughs> what the composition is of the refractory, and this is exactly where we are now. Um, there are two ways only of measuring them. One is in space with instruments which is similar to the mass spectrometer that I showed on Vega, which is still present there. Uh, it's named COSIMA, it's exactly the same sort of time of flight instrument that collect grains and then measure the composition. It's an instrument made in cooperation between uh, Germany and France. Possibly they will be able to measure something, it's not obvious. The other one, of course, is to go back to Philae, because Philae has the capability by stepwise eating to take this material and measure the composition in two different ways, two different uh, lines, including on one side a gas chromatograph, on the other one even chirality and uh, to know whether or not the material there and the refractories has a complexity that goes with. For the moment, the two are possible. Either this carbon-rich material are essentially carbon, like expanded graphite, in which you have some molecules, but not that complex, with, as I say, some amino acids, but low complexity amino acids, or the chemistry went to much higher complexity, but we don't know yet, and that's something I hope we'll know in the coming weeks, because now we are very close to resuming operation, we hope, and then we'll know whether or not this evolution of the solar system early on could go to rather highly complex molecules, including part of these 20 amino acids that we hope to discover uh, rapidly. So, this is not some... This is the distance of the orbit over us now. You don't look at the scale there, but the scale is that um, a few weeks ago at the peak we were more than 1,000 kilometers because essentially because of the activity, the orbit had to go far away because there was too many grains uh, to, to be close to and because the grains uh, ejected there would uh, make the star tracker not capable of doing any positioning. So now we are back, it went, and the plasma physics were there. Now we are close to 400 kilometers, and we can operate only if we are better than 200. So that's a matter of now a few weeks, and we hope that by November uh, we'll be able, for the orbiter geometry, to be close enough. Now the question is whether or not on Philae we'll be able to resume operation. It's still an open question. We went to temperature much lower than the one we qualified our system. So some have, uh, of course, uh, suffered, but we have identified the past weeks and during all the summertime we worked on all what, we had some contact in June, July. So we know that most of the systems are still there and operational. So we have identified the best configuration that we have already put on board and actually it's yesterday that we loaded the order with the system to force our own system to go to the right configuration. And we start now two times a day, because the period is 12 hours, two times a day to communicate. But we are still rather far away, so it would be unlikely that we do that in the coming two or three weeks. But November up to December would be the time in which we hope to resume operation. And then the first thing we'll do, of course, is to warm up the small ovens we have to eat up the samples and measure the composition by many means we have. We have three instruments on board to measure that, to know whether or not we have a complex chemistry that operated there. So. Um, I will finish by that, to say, well, it was sort of a complex things uh, which started 30 years ago. We landed a year ago, and now we hope that uh, resume operation to know whether or not this early material has played a role in the emergence of life. Very much for this nice overview. Let's say if there's only one quick question, that'd be great because we're already running over time. Quick questions and
what the situation and hope with phosphorus, because phosphorus molecules have been found, but uh, grains and spectrometry has not been done on, in comets yet. Okay, I can. Um, there has been some phosphorus found in a few molecules found there, but again, we, phosphorus in the basaltic material in itself. So phosphorus can be connected to the carbon-rich molecules later on. So we're not necessarily looking for phosphorus added to the carbon-rich molecule there. And as it is on there on the DNA, actually, when the phosphorus went probably later in this DNA chain. So we don't need to have the phosphorus already embedded there. What is important, though, is not the phosphorus, but the nitrogen. We need to have amine. We need to have NH2. That never been I discovered before. So the, one of the important things here that for the first time we have shown that the carbonate structures have NH2 inside. And uh, it's more important in a sense for this purpose. For phosphorus, we have no direct evidence that we have any big chain with phosphorus. Does the comet lose ice as it goes by the sun over the Sure. Of course it does. All the, when I saw the jets, when I said the car, it's carbon-rich material, of course the release of this is due to the fact that the grains, the, the icy grains, sublimate, the ice sublimates and free everything. But what is freed is, of course, you have some H2O and CO2. But most of that is the carbon-rich grain. But of course the ice, when you go at, at 1 AU, 1.3, which is now, the temperature is over 200 K and of course it sublimates. Yes and no. It could be, but again, we have an idea of the uh, total amount of that now that we go there, and it has not varies from 3 AU from now. So it could have been, but again, what is, we don't know what the size of this comet prior to be. But when you see a comet uh, acting there, it loses, in that case, something like a meter or so, at a fraction of a meter. It cannot go many passages. So a comet, uh, you know, after 100 times, a comet dies. When you see a comet, it's uh, c'est son champ du signe. It's, uh, it's, it's remained 4.5 billion years very far away. In a slide I didn't show, we know where we think it was. But then just by a gravitational perturbation, it went closer and start to, and then immediately evaporates and fell out. And it's only a few thousand years as compared to 4.5 billion years. So yes, it was true that at the beginning, the people said what you see at the surface is not representative. But now when we see, first of all, that we have new material there and we have with a high resolution structures in which we can see the <laughs> stratification, you see wherever you look, the same material. So the bulk is probably exactly what you have at the surface. The surface is. So the dust of a grain might be a little different. It's true, instead of 15%, it might be around 25%. But I think the important thing is that carbon was dominant in the early collapsing cloud. Well, it's a very good time to stop now because this video has gone over quite a long time. So if you have any questions, feel free to comment, talk to the speaker after. So let's take, uh, thank Jean-Pierre again for thank a very you. nice talk. Thank you, I appreciate it. <laughs>